ethology records uh, for 36 species of primates. I'm actually going to skip to the next slide and kind of talk about how we put this database together. In putting our database together, one of the great things about the zoo accreditation format in the United States is that with this, all of the kind of species in our database have to go through a necropsy. So part of your accreditation in the United States, everyone, all of the species under zoo care go through a necropsy. So you really get this kind of natural formation of a database that you can kind of implore these questions like, do all species that we know get cancer? What is the, let's go back here. Do all, is cancer kind of uniform across the tree of life? Are there differences in cancer prevalence across the tree of life? So far and so forth. So you get this kind of wealth of questions that you can ask when you kind of spend the time to collect these veterinarian pathology records. Um, within primates, so most of the time, like in our big comparative oncology um, project, we did just necropsies. So basically, we would go and try to find zoos to partner with in the United States and find ways that we could uh, kind of utilize their data. Um, and within, and we just focused on necropsies, right? So as part of that accreditation, they all get necropsies. We focus on necropsy because it's kind of like the cleanest data. We know the, you know, the entire maximum lifespan that that individual lived. We know kind of all of the potential pathologies that could have come up during this, so on and so forth. In primates to kind of, because primates, we had much less data. I mean, if you think about all of the potential animals that are kept in kind of American zoo captivity, primates are a small subsection of that. So while we were able to build a really large database of kind of all vertebrate uh, pathology records, when you look down at primates, you kind of have to broaden our search a little bit so we can pick up as much data as we can to kind of find the kind of signals that we're looking for. Um, so within this, we kind of shifted from just focusing on primate necropsies to looking at primate necropsies and biopsies. So all of the data that we kind of are gonna talk about today are kind of a compilation of veterinarian biopsies that were done on kind of suspected tumors or suspected lesions um, in primates that are in uh, captivity in zoos um, or necropsies. That is just like a survey of any potential pathologies upon that animal's death. Um, with this, we get, uh, of all of these species that we collected, we had 36 primate species of which we had 2000 or so um, individuals. So a really large, sizable database, especially if, uh, just for focusing on primates. And within this, we actually just get a rather small collection of neoplasias. So neoplasias here is going to encompass both benign and malignant tumors. Um, and then out of those, 299 were full malignancies. Um, and I want to mention here that most of the data that we have comes from these zoo pathology records. Um, but we also have this kind of working partnership with the Duke Lemur Center. So as you look at some of the kind of data visualizations that we'll talk about today, you see this kind of maybe overrepresentation of lemurs, and we just have a lot of data from the Duke Lemur Center. A lot of issues in comparative oncology come up. So when you're thinking about, you know, asking questions about human medicine within species that are in zoos, there's a bunch of natural kind of problems or barriers to successful research in these things. Um, one of the common uh, things that comes up is lifespan, right? You kind of have this natural assumption or it's easy to assume um, that species in a zoo kind of uniformly have this incredible expansion on their lifespan, um, but that's not completely true, right? You can look at any couple Netflix documentaries about kind of the conditions and kind of lifespans and wellness that animals sometimes suffer in zoos. I mean, you'd also expect like when you take small vertebrates or small mammals like mice and rabbits, you have this kind of expansion of their natural lifespan because you've removed predation. Um, but in other animals, especially in what we think of like social mammals, large social mammals, of which primates, you know, make up a huge portion of, in those large social mammals, you also have some kind of detriments to their kind of wellness and lifespan. So you don't have this uniform effect of every animal in captivity lives longer than you would expect. And there's also things like what we, you know, diagnosing human cancers um, is a very specific endeavor, right? We describe tumors now, um, you know, at the kind of microscopy scale, at the genomic scale, we have this really large bandwidth of ways that we can kind of molecularly describe tumors, um, but we don't have such motivations or kind of common practice in animal tumors. So you kind of get this ambiguity in the uh, database where you can just say, oh, you know, we found a tumor in the lung. Sometimes, you know, as we saw in our database, sometimes you can see um, that these are full malignancies, but otherwise they're just described as tumors, right? Kind of poorly described tumors. So all these things are things that need to be addressed if you want to go on to make statements about cancer in any, in any subgroup of these animals, right? Um, but to focus on the central question, which is lifespan, because that to me, when I was starting the comparative oncology work, that seemed to be like a central issue. If you're gonna make claims on how evolution or natural selection has shaped species susceptibilities uh, to disease, um, if you're looking at the database and the database has this really large kind of 
um, expansion of tumors found solely because these animals just live forever. Uh, and cancer incidence is kind of a factor of lifespan. That's, you know, there's a lot of issues in there. And a lot of the conclusions you're gonna bring from that are gonna come with faulty assumptions. Um, so I really want to focus on how that bias may or may not be present in our database. Um, and the really cool thing here is if you see, if you look at these kind of lateral bars uh, on this violin plot, the lateral bar represents the group's average lifespan. And this average lifespan is their wild lifespan, um, not their maximum lifespan that they can get um, in the zoo. And if you look at this, all of these indiv uh, individual dots are diagnoses of cancers or benign tumors. So I think this is all of uh, all neoplasias here. And the vast, vast majority of all the neoplasias uh, documented in our database happen well before the conclusion of their natural lifespan. Um, so it's not to say, like this graph doesn't show that primates don't live longer uh, than they you know, do in the wild in zoos. They certainly do. But as far as looking at specific pathologies like cancer or tumors found, the vast majority of them are found much before the conclusion of their natural lifespan. So you have your first kind of hint there that we, uh, we can kind of go forward in making conclusions, kind of evolutionary-based conclusions on this data set, because we're getting at least some fair representation um, of what we'd expect to see if we we're studying them in the wild. If we expand this to our kind of complete comparative oncology database, which I think comprises like 100,000 individuals over a couple hundred um, species of vertebrates uh, in zoos, this pattern is kind of universal across all of our zoo data. So even though there is this kind of non-uniform distribution um, of lifespan extension in zoo animals, um, you still see that the vast majority of those tumors are found before the conclusion of their natural lifespan. So both looking in primates and outside primates and other animal groups that you might be interested in asking questions about either oncology or other aspects of kind of comparative medicine, um, you see a lot of these pathologies are diagnosed uh, well within that window of their natural lifespan. So kind of looking now within primates and focusing on with the data that we have, we've done some you know, work as I described to validate some of this data. Um, what can we do with that data? Um, and so the first thing is to do, we have a pretty good, pretty clear and complete portrait of the common human cancer types, right? Um, we know which are most common, which are the most deadly, so on and so forth. And looking in, in primates, we can do the same kind of analyses, right? Um, because the first kind of cut into looking at the primate data was just trying to I mean, it was kind of counting beans in a bat, right? We're trying to figure out how many tumors in these species and what we can discern about differences in their kind of natural prevalence of cancers. But once that's done, we can kind of take this a step deeper and looking at our, if we're looking at our kind of phylogenetic evolutionary relationship with us among primates, um, do we share the most common types of cancer? You know, when looking at comparative medicine, one of the driving questions is gonna be, you know, what about the human condition? What about the human experience, especially the Western human condition? describes you know, the commonalities of our maladies, right? And so if we were to look at, if we're looking at cancer types and comparing the common cancer types between us and primates, you would begin to get an idea of, you know, if they're very similar, maybe what drives our most common cancers isn't fundamentally just kind of a mismatch in the environment, um, or if they're very different, as we're gonna start to see, uh, maybe this starts to kind of build our ability to make hypotheses um, on that. Um, if you look at this, so the, uh, first breakdown here is just by cancer types, broad cancer types, carcinomas, solid tumors, uh, blood cancers, the hematopoietic cancers here, and sarcomas. And so this pie graph, if you're going to make it of human cancers, like which cancers are, you know, what proportion of diagnosed cancers are solid tumors versus blood cancers versus the kind of tumors in the connective tissue uh, marked by sarcoma, which of those, um, you know, what are the most common? Human and primates here very similar, right? The vast majority of diagnosed cancers in humans are solid tumors, kind of followed by a, a very long distance second place in blood cancers, and then an even further third place in sarcoma. I mean, uh, the sarcoma makes up about 1% of diagnosed human malignancies. Um, and then with that, we kind of strike at our first difference, uh, which is that uh, in the primate data set, 8% of the malignancies, that 299 number, 8% of those are sarcomas. And so with that, when you think about differences in how humans and the rest of the primates use their connective tissues and joints and the structure of those joints, um, right, that right there would set you up for kind of an evolutionary-based question or investigation on what kind of drives that difference. And looking at the common cancer types, now we're talking a little bit deeper. So we've kind of dug into the solid tumors here. Um, what are the most common solid tumors? So on the right-hand side, we have some of the common human cancer types. Many of these will be uh, familiar, of course. Breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, those three cancers alone describe the vast majority of diagnosed human solid tumors. Um, but when you look at the uh, solid tumors in primates, 
you get a very different portrait, right? You still get a lot of skin cancer. I mean, one of the kind of hypotheses that came out of this, and there's some papers uh, from another group that have been written on this, is that you know the our loss of a good portion of our body hair in evolutionary time kind of drives this wild increase that we have in skin cancer or otherwise kind of an environmental mismatch. Um, but we see even in primates, not that that's not true, right? It could, that could be. Uh, but even in primates, um, they have a pretty high proportion of skin uh, malignancies, right? Not just benign tumors. The vast majority of their solid diagnosed tumors were gastrointestinal. Um, you can notice here that the breakdown in our kind of pathology groupings is not perfectly symmetrical uh, with the human one. This is just because, again, when we think about that slide that I had with the trees on there and some of the issues with uh, comparative data and using zoo data, is we don't have you know, perfectly concentric diagnostic terms, right? Um, so a lot of these tumors that could be you know, pancreas, colon, stomach, esophagus, all of these are kind of grouped by the diagnosing veterinarian as just gastrointestinal tumors. Um, so it's difficult to kind of break that down to see how that reflects on these kind of more specific subgroups that you see in humans. Go ahead. Just wondering, if malignant tumor locations, does that mean where the tumor's home to it? Like, the, were they metastasized too? Or they... Tissue of origin, yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, good point. At, at any point, if you want to interrupt me, that's totally fine. Um, so, the, and as we go down, so that we don't have a perfect reflection of these uh, groupings, and it's kind of difficult to break these down. Um, with these, you get like a, a paragraph of pathologist notes. Uh, sometimes they're shorter, sometimes they're longer, I guess, depending on the pathologist's mood. Um, and, you know, sometimes in reading the associated pathologist notes, you can kind of gleam where specifically within gastrointestinal the tissue of origin was or the um, organ of origin. Um, but with the volume of records that we have, it becomes difficult. Um, so we're kind of working on ways and developing software to kind of auto process a lot of these kind of more detailed uh, pathologist reports. Um, but that's kind of in the works. Um, so a very different portrait of common cancer types uh, between humans and primates. If you look at just benign tumors, so now that we've we've taken out the full malignant tumors, and just looking at benign tumors, you have a very similar kind of uh, representation here, meaning that like the most common benign tumors uh, in our primate data set um, kind of reflects pretty well on the most common malignancies you see, um, which is slightly different in humans. We have a lot of really common human neoplasias that are just permanently neoplastic, they never progress into full cancers, and oftentimes we don't expect them to ever, um, that don't aren't necessarily reflective of the common cancer types in humans. Um, I know something that this center is particularly interested in, and people from this center have assisted us in, is kind of the question of sex bias um, in both human cancers and cancers in non-humans. Um, and this was one of the first times, there's been reports, especially like, uh, I think there's been a paper in primates on it and other kind of smaller subclasses within mammals looking at this question of sex bias. So in humans, we know that we have this kind of male uh, tinted uh, sex bias for cancers. A lot of that male bias in, in cancer prevalence is driven by um, liver cancers. Um, and so there's been a lot of kind of focus from the evolutionary medicine field on what describes maybe what genomic mechanisms describe this difference in sex. Uh, uh, the differences in uh, uh, sex-based cancers. Um, but if we look at uh, within primates, the pattern has flipped here. Um, important to note here that all of the reproductive tumors or cancers have been taken out of this. So this is just looking at tumors in which, uh, uh, looking at tumors and tissues that both males and females have. Um, and you have a slight female bias. Um, it's significant, but it's not dramatic, both in benign tumors and overall malignant tumors. You have a little bit more um, dramatic change there in malignant tumors, but still you have this kind of flip um, from a male biased uh, cancer prevalence uh, in humans uh, to a female um, bias in primates. And this pattern holds up even when we extend this across all mammals, right? Um, so in this slide here, we have all of the mammals in our comparative oncology database, and it's much more dramatic, right? And again, all of the reproductive tissues, um, uh, all the cancers from reproductive tissues have been removed here. Go ahead. Uh, no, this is not age controlled. No, this analysis. No, um, we have some age data, um, but not a ton of age data, right? Um, for I, sh I should take that back. From what you saw with those distributions on like age at diagnosis, we have that very often, um, but we don't often have age at where some of these um, that like connected to specific pathology reports, right? We have like a distribution of age um, and diagnosis or age of diagnosis, I should say. Um, so a much more profound one, this includes primates, of course, this starts at primates and expands to mammals, um, but a much more dramatic um, female tinted sex bias there. 
in standard comparative oncology, when we first try to kind of use an evolutionary basis to make predictions on the patterns of cancer prevalence that we observe across the tree of life, um, a big driving force in our group at ASU was to use kind of life history theory, right? How does the kind of tempo and mode of a species traits dictate um, where we'd expect natural selection to have intervened uh, to kind of enhance cancer suppressive mechanisms in those species. Um, and that was really successful. I mean, when you look across all species, like in our larger comparative oncology projects, there are several life history variables, body mass, gestation length, um, longevity, natural lifespan, or maximum lifespan. All of these had a really strong predictive power in the cancer prevalence that we see in, across all species. Um, but when we tried to apply this to primates, uh, we didn't get a lot of signal there. Um, so on the right-hand side here, we have gestation, um, body, adult body weight, and adult uh, or max longevity. None of these, which are really kind of described so much of the variation, both in cancer generally across mammals um, and across all of the clades of vertebrate species that we have in our data set, um, even though there's such a kind of dramatic power to make predictions there, nothing really here. Um, so this is where we kind of start looking at developing what we're going to get into, like these kind of comparative phylogenetic models of disease risk, um, because in kind of the standard application of comparative oncology here, um, we don't get too much signal. A really cool experiment that our um, collaborators at the Huntsman Cancer Institute in Salt Lake City have been working on um, that, again, shows some really cool dramatic results in the larger comparative oncology data set um, that aren't super uh, predictive uh, in primates is these functional cell assays. Um, so Carlo mentioned that I'm kind of fundamentally interested in the emergence and evolution of multicellularity, and I really use that as a lens to understand kind of evolutionary dynamics uh, in the evolution of cancer suppression. Um, so if we take a kind of derail this for a second and think about the evolution of multicellularity. Um, if we're thinking about a cluster of cells on a rock that just emerged from the primordial sea, we can, it's kind of easy to imagine, this is where kind of thought experiments are still useful in evolutionary biology. We can kind of make a thought experiment there that if we're a cluster of cells and there's at some point that cluster of cells has transitioned from independent replicators of cells that are all just kind of behaving like we understand bacteria to behave today as replicating together as one unit. And as that unit began to replicate um, as a unit, we have what we see is, uh, or can think of as like these kind of pseudo-somatic cells, right? All of those cells now that, that were on the side of the rock are not individuals, but rather individual cells amongst one organism, right? Um, and so that thought experiment there would be like, what is, what would be helpful in that time, right? Like, what are some kind of fundamental rules in the emergence of multicellularity? And one that kind of stems from cooperation theory is if you have a cluster of cells that makes up one organism and something happens to one of those cells in the organism, some kind of DNA damage, uh, has been incurred in the cell, and otherwise the cell has been um, um, affected by something in some way, what is the cooperative thing for that cell to do in the context of it being part of this multicellular body? And the cooperative thing to do is apoptose right away, right? It's not to cling onto life and see if we can try to maybe repair the DNA damage or just kind of keep going through cell cycle unchecked or unregulated. You want to get rid of that cell. It's not, if you think now, especially like in living species, we have trillions of cells, it is completely you know, no big deal if we lose one of our cells. If something happens to one of our cells, we want to get rid of that cell. So the cooperative thing to do in this thought experiment is for that cell to apoptose. So how this kind of guides into how we make predictions uh, in this kind of large scale comparative oncology is that if we take a cell, a primate fibroblast as we have here, um, but we've done this with all, uh, I think 40 or 50 species now, um, we take some primate fibroblasts and we induce some kind of DNA damage. We've done this via radiation or Dr. Rubinson. And so you induce DNA damage, you apply this kind of DNA damaging agent, whatever it may be, radiation or else. And we see how sensitive those cells are, how quickly those cells apoptose, right? And so the quicker they ap apoptose, the more sensitive that they are to DNA damage, we think as, you know, kind of on a species level, that'd be better for cancer suppression, right? The longer that those kind of damaged cells cling to their individual cellular life, keep driving through um, cellular replication, um, the worst is off, right? Because that, there is some chance, even small, when we're talking about individual cells, there's some chance that that cell is going to progress into cancer. Or otherwise, even if it's not progressing into cancer, it's not helpful, right? If the cell has suffered DNA damage to the extent where it's not performing its kind of somatic function in the cell, it's not participating in the somatic body, it, there's, no, there's no use for it. The, the, uh, the best case scenario is that it apoptosis, that we get that cell out of there. Even if we don't assume that it's going to turn into cancer, it's not great to have a bunch of kind of non-functional or pseudo-functioning cells hanging around. Um, so we look at this. So in this kind of, um, in these functional cell assays, they apply some DNA damaging agent. Uh, I think in this graph, it's Dr. Rubison. Um, and then measure how quickly 
either there's kind of two measurements you can make. One, how quickly those cells go into apoptosis or the percent of cell death at some time point, right? And the higher, the prediction would be the higher percent cell death after DNA damage, uh, the better the picture looks for cancer suppression. Um, and we have some, I mean, there's some cool results here just looking at one, these studies really haven't been done uh, anywhere else in the scope of species that our group has collected, right? This isn't super reflective of a lot of species because we're just looking at primates. Um, but even, you know, if it doesn't fit perfectly within our framework statistically, it's still really interesting to see kind of for the first time um, putting these uh, kind of different and kind of diverse species through this analysis um, and looking at how different cell lines across the tree of life respond to things that we encounter every day, like DNA damage. So with kind of the DNA damage and functioning, uh, functional cell assays not working or not kind of adding to a predictive framework um, and the kind of standard life history framework not serving us, um, we kind of had to really sit back and try to figure out what, what's the interesting story to paint here, right? Because you can go on about how using primates is an interesting model system to studying common human pathologies, especially cancer, um, but we have to get something out of it, right? Um, and especially, you know, it's, um, if we're thinking about using primates as a model organism, what, how do we kind of drive that? How do we have that be like a hypothesis driven thing, right? Um, so one of the things that we want to look at that'd be interesting as kind of both comparative oncology and kind of evolutionary medicine broadly is interested in is like, what about human mismatch? What about our kind of misplacement from our ancestral environment? Keep ancestral in quotations here. Um, what about our mismatch from that explains disease, right? Explains both the high prevalence of disease, um, especially diseases that we used to commonly associate with kind of old age. Um, so kind of cognitive decline, cancer, metabolic syndromes and diseases. A lot of these are coming up more and more. And so is it environment or is it something else? You know, what is this? And so the first thing we want to look at is in looking at kind of cancer across primates, one thing we hadn't done yet, and for, a, uh, and for a good reason that I'll get into, is kind of put this in the context of humans. Like if we have cancer rates for all of these primate species on this kind of primate clade shown here, uh, now that we have cancer rates for all of them, what does this look like compared to humans, right? And the reason we had kind of not thrown humans into the context of this kind of analysis and this comparison is that it's kind of really hard to get a lifetime, uh, a good estimate of cancer prevalence in humans, especially benign tumors, right? Um, it's pretty straightforward as we have here, um, the most recent estimate of kind of lifetime cancer prevalence in humans. Um, but so many of our analyses, just to kind of bulk the amount of uh, data points that we use, just look at benign tumors. And we just have a really poor estimate of the total kind of lifetime prevalence or any prevalence at all of common human benign tumors. Um, so taking humans at 40%, this kind of 40% lifetime cancer prevalence and placing them within the primate phylogeny, um, you know that you can measure two things. Uh, one really doesn't take much of a measurement, which is uh, humans are an extreme outlier there, right? Um, none of these, all of this is kind of heat mapped as in red is higher cancer. And when you put humans in this, without humans, you kind of see a kind of a natural variation, even though kind of like the average cancer prevalence across primates was like 13 or 15%, much, much lower than humans. But still, when humans are kind of uh, displaced from the phylogeny, you get this kind of natural gradient where you can study kind of the rate of evolution uh, of cancer prevalence, if you think of cancer prevalence as a trait, which we can get into. But once you put humans in there, the phylogeny is almost nondescript anymore, right? Because you have this entire blue region that compared to humans have such drastically lower cancer prevalences. Um, but within humans, or by placing humans on this phylogeny, we can kind of take ancestral state reconstructions. And there's several ways kind of Methodolog uh, there's several different methods of kind of doing an ancestral state reconstruction, which is trying to, at any of these nodes, right? This is some kind of primate ancestor and here at this node, the kind of common ancestor of all primates. So if we're trying to see like, uh, if we're thinking about, if you're interested in like kind of human origins and human evolution, just kind of looking at the hominid branch here, um, where is, if, if uh, there's an assumption here that like, let's say that environment mismatch has nothing to do with the kind of in, the high rate of cancer prevalence that we see in humans. Let's just say environment has nothing to do with it. Um, so let's see like where phylogenetically in which of these divergence points and which of these nodes uh, do we see like a dramatic shift in cancer prevalence, right? So the kind of simplest way that you can really do kind of like a, a napkin equation to figure out an ancestral state reconstruction is just taking the tip means and that like the mean of the tips of the node um, describe uh, or describe the prevalence there. There's more advanced methods, which I'll show next in a kind of a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, but even in this one, you see 
the kind of takeaway point here is humans have this really high cancer prevalence. Um, and as you look at that, it kind of displaces our ability to make, I mean, if we're assuming that this is correct, um, it kind of displaces our ability to kind of make hypothesis driven questions on where in human ancestry did this divergence happen where we get this really crazy increase in cancer prevalence, right? So looking at this, you begin to think to yourself that the people kind of going on about mismatch have something to say, right? Because within this, and especially within the rest of hominins, really dramatic rate, right? And so you really can't assume that any kind of phylo uh, anything that happened kind of internally on this phylogeny describes such a dramatic change. Here, this says neoplasia and malignancy prevalence here, but this is not, the color map here is not showing the true neoplasia prevalence or malignancy prevalence. This is showing the rate of evolution. Um, and there's, a, it's kind of evolutionary rate. Uh, there's some kind of same thing as ancestral rate reconstructions. There's kind of complicated ways to think about the rate of evolution, um, especially if we're talking about species, like what is the rate of speciation or species evolution? Um, but here, when the trait on the phylogeny that we're interested in is neoplasia prevalence um, or malignancy prevalence, um, it's really simple, right? Uh, this evolutionary rate is just a rate of change. How fast, if we have two species here, uh, you remember that uh, microcebus over here had one of the highest uh, malignancy prevalences and the species immediately adjacent to it on the phylogeny had a very low cancer prevalence. So the rate of change, which here we're calling evolutionary rate is very high, it's a very simplistic estimate of evolutionary rate. Um, and so both of these you can see that the evolutionary rate, as you'd expect, highlights, I think it highlights a little bit more descriptively on the phylogeny, um, regions where there's kind of dramatic shifts. So in thinking about trying to estimate and trying to make measurements of either internal cancer prevalence, like ancestral cancer, uh, cancer risk um, with this, we're looking at, um, we try to make a prediction on what would be if phylogeny, if humans had a cancer prevalence that was more reflective of the other species within kind of the hominin clade or kind of wider within primates, if they had a cancer prevalence that was more reflective of their phylogenetic relationship to the rest of the species, what would their predicted cancer prevalence be, right? So in this analysis, you have true measured neoplasia or malignancy prevalence for these species taken from the zoo data. And then in humans, you put question mark. And so in the analysis, it basically takes phylogenetic distance and the cancer prevalence or the cancer data on each of the tips of that tree and tries to create a formulation of what it would be if it was more reflective of just phylogenetic distance, right? Because if we exclude humans from the analysis, phylogenetic distance alone is incredibly predictive of the differences in cancer risk across primates. Meaning that if you have some subgroup of primates here, let's, let's just think about uh, this subgroup described by this node. If you have the cancer prevalence for each of these species and you just remove a data point for one of the species and try to make a prediction just based off of a regression from phylogenetic distance, we can almost perfectly predict um, what that cancer prevalence is in those primates, right? So you can kind of check what uh, kind of um, check for yourselves when we make these human estimates by just trying to sample it in other ways, right? We take one of our known data points, remove it, try the same analysis that we did on trying to estimate the human cancer prevalence and seeing if it matches the number that we really have. And we have really close estimates that match uh, the cancer prevalence, both benign and malignant, um, from our zoo data. Um, when you think about, I kind of will touch on again about zoo, the issues with zoo data again. There's kind of two, kind of two things can be the case, and they can kind of be the case at the same time. But there's only really two possibilities when we think about the nature of zoo animals and the nature of the pathologies that we find in zoo animals. One is kind of somewhat unlikely that the portrait of pathologies and disease that we see in kind of captive species is perfectly reflective of the pathologies that they suffer in the wild, right? And the opposite, uh, the kind of more critical one, uh, which is kind of equally unlikely, is that all of the pathologies or the vast majority of pathologies found in the zoo are due because those animals are in a zoo, right? It's likely some blended effect, right? You see, you know, I'm confident, especially in our wider comparative oncology kind of pursuits where we have, you know, hundreds of species and hundreds of thousands of records, that we get some true portrait of the disease risk, in this case, cancer, that we see in those species with some kind of plus or minus modifications. But what's important is that uh, in the kind of critical aspect where zoos are driving the, uh, the state of the zoo and the diet of the zoo and X, Y, and Z, all of the kind of unnatural 
scenarios in which a zoo presents a captive animal, if that's the case, if that drives a lot of pathologies, it ought to serve as some kind of canary in the coal mine for human disease, right? If we take these animals out of the wild or they're born in captivity and they kind of live like the zoos down the street, they have a very similar environment. Their diet obviously is a lot different. Oftentimes they have a different diet than their wild diet, um, but it's not as easy to kind of compare human and kind of captive animals diet. But if we're just thinking about the importance of environment, things like there's been a lot of interest lately in fasting, right? Um, so kind of earlier when we were kind of having this kind of crisis of metabolic diseases and syndromes in the United States or in Western countries, um, one of the issues was like with the type of food, right? There was like, there's a mismatch in what we would, the majority of our calories would come from ancestrally and where our calories come from today, right? And that's obviously a big driver. But another thing that uh, we can use, zoo, I mean, it comes to mind that zoo animals would be kind of a natural model for, um, and we have a lot of kind of cool theory papers out there that people have written, is just the constant access to calories uh, being a driver of disease, right? Both cancer and metabolic diseases. So it doesn't, uh, they've shown in, in mice and other kind of model organisms that even if you, it doesn't really matter what you feed the animal, you can feed them a high caloric diet, um, junk food, like some kind of simulated junk food, you still fare better on metabolic syndromes and cancer uh, when just the window at which you have access to calories every day is reduced, right? Um, and really cool, even though it's kind of a funky model system for cancer, really cool um, uh, results in hydra. So you can kind of have hydra that get, these are like these little water things, and they can get little tumors in the lab. Um, interestingly, though, if you go collect wild hydra, you don't find any tumors, right? You've no one's ever been going around, look at the hydra, and they find a little tumor on it, right? But when they put it in a lab to grow it for other experiments, and it has perfect conditions, constant access to food, like the back of the seed packet says, feed it X, Y, and Z times a day, you do that perfectly, you get all these spontane uh, spontaneous tumor developments, right? Um, so all of that to say, in our kind of pursuit, I mean, ASU was kind of first in this scene to kind of think about one health, what about the, the marriage of information between the ecosystem, animal species, and our own health? How does that better our understanding and our ability to kind of act on these things in all three of those dimensions? Um, and it's a pursuit that U of A is uh, really involved in as well. Um, so all that to say, all of the issues that may be present in using data from captive species in making kind of the evolutionary comparisons that I'm interested in making, they still serve as a really great system to understand some of the pathologies uh, that may be driven by kind of our evolutionary and environmental mismatch. Okay, I'll end with, uh, Carlos says I kind of like to think deeply about evolutionary theory, which I try to do occasionally. And I often say like one of the things, the only thing I maybe didn't like about my PhD with Carlo is that me and Carlo agree about everything. I mean, we never get into a spirited debate, we agree about everything. Um, but towards the end of my PhD, I, I started to think critically about something Really, I was just trying to be dramatic and think of a way we could disagree about something. And one of the things that came to mind uh, was this idea of the evolution of cancer suppression, right? So underwritten in this kind of all of this comparative oncology work is that cancer suppression evolves, right? Natural selection has shaped mechanisms to directly limit the initiation progression of tumors, right? Um, so implicit in that assumption is that tumors are causing some kind of death, one within the reproductive window, um, in the fertile window, and or disruption, right? It doesn't have to kill the species, but it disrupts them, impacts fitness in some way in those animals, right? Um, and that seemed possible. I mean, we know that wild animals get cancer. Looking at the comparative oncology data now, that story fits perfectly, right? Um, that natural selection has shaped mechanisms that specifically constrain cancer. Um, but when you think about somatic maintenance broadly, uh, and somatic maintenance broadly, just think about all of the mechanisms we have in place to preserve the functioning cells that we have in our body. There are those mechanisms, if you think about a genomic mechanism to detect DNA damage and shut a cell down, that, that's valuable all the way down the line, 10 steps before you get to cancer, right? Because that cell, if you have some kind of DNA damage, you can't get rid of the cell, the cell's just laying around in your body consuming energy, but not adding anything, right? So when we think about the evolution of multicellularity, um, it's a little bit easier to picture, right? If you have five cells working together in one organism, if one cell has some kind of damage, we're just kind of soaking up calories and not doing anything for the group, their natural selection will intercede. You expect natural selection to intercede and, and drive the formation of mechanisms to restrain or constrain those, right? So that you can uh, kind of trying to optimize the ability for cells to cooperate together in this multicellular um, organism. Um, so thinking about that, um, so with that in my mind, 
um, I kind of, one of the projects that I've uh, been pursuing is a method called phylostratigraphy, which is basically tracing gene ancestry on phylogenies, right? Um, so in the same way that you can do kind of human ancestry, you can do gene ancestry and look at its change by state in specific letters or whatever, um, and see uh, kind of both, the biggest thing is measuring homology in other species, right? How much is a tumor suppressor gene that we have in humans like P53? What does it look like in species as you go back kind of an evolutionary time? And one of the interesting things in doing that, which was a result that's been out for a long time that I was not super familiar with, is like this really deep homology between BRCA1 and 2 uh, in humans and BRCA1 and 2 in funguses. And BRCA, of course, stands for like breast cancer related gene. And so reading that, you know, you wouldn't be wrong to be curious what the breast cancer related gene is doing in a fungus, right? It might be doing something that we don't fully understand as we're kind of hyper fixated on human disease. Um, in calling it the breast cancer related gene, if it has such a deep 97 or 98% homology in these invertebrate animals, right? And so uh, we got together and started thinking about what is the benefit other than getting to disagree with your PhD advisor, which is rare in my case, what's the benefit of thinking about it like that way? Um, and so basically our hypothesis and our kind of reason for kind of thinking about the evolution of cancer suppression would be thinking about what are we missing in this story by assuming that these mechanisms have been directly shaped via natural selection to constrain cancer? Is there something about this that we fail to understand or fail to appreciate with our kind of looking at these broad mechanisms of somatic maintenance and somatic protective mechanisms? Our obsession with cancer is that blinding us in some way by its true function, right? Um, there ought to be a lot of things, if you think about P53, the kind of guardian of the uh, genome, um, and it's, it really oversees tons and tons of genomic networks all related in somatic maintenance and DNA damage repair and cell death, all of these mechanisms. And those are all broadly important to multicellularity universally, right? Even in organisms uh, that don't, uh, that can't get true cancers, they get kind of, kind of pseudo cancers or whatever. All of those things are important long before you get to a tumor um, um, initiating and progressing, right? Um, so something to think about, it's been like a year since I published a paper um, where everyone yelled at me on Twitter. And so it's about that time of year again. Um, so I wanted to get this out. I submitted this uh, to Evolutionary Medicine and Public Health uh, this month. Uh, so just kind of food for thought there. I think I'll leave it there. Oh, there's a really grinding slide after this that I did not design, but I have to show you because U of A wants me to tell you that they're recruiting postdocs. Um, but I don't know who designed the slide, but I was like, I'm not putting that in the middle of my slide deck. Um, so anyways, this is some contact information up here. Uh, the T32 that they're running uh, in Tucson is cool on a couple fronts. One, uh, salary is competitive, um, but what's really interesting is the availability of research and travel funds that are like super, super generous, right? Um, so there's kind of, what I really liked about this program that they put together, um, it doesn't work for everybody, is that like you don't have a, as a postdoc, you don't have like a mentor in the normal sense, like you're going to work for somebody or work in someone's specific lab. You're kind of a free agent in the university. Um, so there's, I think there's now two or three T32s at U of A and everybody does wildly different things, um, which is cool in a sense, right? Um, so I have to show you that. My email is up on the thank you slide. You're welcome to reach out to me if you guys have questions about it. And otherwise, uh, I appreciate your time and I'll take your questions. Forty-five. Great talk, Thanks, Thanks so much. So I was wondering, uh, you showed a really cool graph showing apoptosis rates across a bunch of different primates. Do humans fall in that same regression line? You know, I don't know. We've um, um, a lot of times. I think in this measurement here, yeah, it is neoplasia. Uh, we don't put the human dot because we don't have a good human neoplasia dot. Um, and so that's really why we don't really have a complete portrait of what it looks like when you include humans. We've done it before for malignancy, um, but just because we have more data for neoplasia, we did it for neoplasia here, and it's just kind of hard to place that human dot. We don't have a great estimate, but interesting for sure. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was really curious about the the female bias um, sex difference in cancer prevalence in non-human primates. And like, do you have thoughts on why that is? Are there explanations out there? No, I mean, there's not a full explanation, of course. Um, this Actually, the sex bias stuff that I showed you, well, actually, most of this stuff is unpublished. Um, so I don't know. Like, when you think about 
Um, what really needs to be done is looking at, there's going to be an obvious sex bias between males and females when you look at specifically reproductive tissues, which I said were excluded from here, uh, just because females generally have a, just a larger volume of reproductive tissue. But it would be interesting when we think about environmental mismatch, I think primates, captive primates especially, are a great model to think about how the timing and tempo of birth affects cancer rates, um, especially in breast cancer. We know that like timing of first pregnancy, duration of pregnancy, a lot of that stuff sets into motion kind of maturation of breast ductal cells and stuff like that that confer a lifetime protective effect in breast cancer. Um, so on the specific question, I don't know, um, but it's, it's interesting to think about when we think about trying to incorporating the differences in reproductive tissues. Thank you. Um, I sort of had a follow-up to that. So do you think part of it could be explained by things that other primates don't do, like smoking and drinking and things that are tend to be more common in males than females? Um, and what kind of proportion that would explain? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I gave a talk yesterday, and that's what I kind of touched on a little bit, is that, um, you know, that we have a lot of liver cancer in males, and then also the thinking is that it's just driven by risk-taking behavior in males, increase all of the things that are risky, higher uh, propensity to do it in males. That's true. That could be the case, right? And you expect it to be the case. Um, and if you're, I said yesterday in my talk, there's no good way to test that, right? But this would be a good way to do it, right? Looking at this, it seems like that really, I mean, it doesn't prove it, but it really adds to that narrative. Uh, but then you arrive at the problem, well, why is there a female sex bias then, right? So you're kind of back and square one going back and forth. But yeah, no, great point. So again, great talk. Uh, Thank you. I, the the uh, human, you know, outliers, you know, obviously quite provocative. But I'd be curious: Have you, if you look at human? I'm sure that's driven largely by European and American and uh, and other industrialized population rates. Right. What 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 does it look like if you look at maybe humans without maybe environmental mismatch? Humans in indigenous populations or in other groups that uh, maybe are living a more traditional lifestyle. What's their cancer rate? Yeah. All more on the line. Yeah. I mean, well, one thing is yesterday I got some feedback that and when I give talks, I never put future direction slide. I just try to talk about that naturally, but that would go in the future direction slide, right? Which is one, it's kind of illustrious to look at Western um, pathologies and disease data sets because we have so much data, right? You have SEER, you have a wealth of, especially in the United States, and in Western Europe, you have a wealth of kind of cancer data, health outcome data, stuff like that. But the fundamental question is that. I mean, if you can, I'm not currently aware of um, kind of cancer prevalence data frames, I'm sure that there are um, in kind of non-Western countries or non-mismatched countries. Um, but as economies shift, the ability to describe something as kind of non-Western is increasingly shrinking, right? Um, so that's another thing to think about in looking for that and how you'd put together a non-mismatched data. I don't know of any. Yeah. Like, it's hard to get to this data, right? Right. Right. Yeah. I don't know of any any data on like small scale societies or sort of our best models for ancestral data. The WHO data includes non Western countries, but it's not, but it's still yeah. very much mismatched. And that is lower. It's not 40% lifetime risk. My memory of it is it's a 14% overall worldwide. Like Might know. Yeah. But what, one thing that I worry a little bit about that is that, like, we might have some really high quality imaging and, like, uh, you know, biomarker diagnosis we do in the US and Europe that couldn't be done in other places. So we might miss those cancers. Right. Which actually was one of the things I thought was really interesting um, was what we didn't find, which was you can see bone or brain cancers. Because um, those are, like, the two easiest to see. Right. Like if, in humans, pathologists have easy, they show up one species, uh -huh. look pretty much the same, and then you know, you look for the same things. But imagine for like these zoo vets that are doing these pathologies, often they're probably aren't an actual pathologist, they're probably just like a zoo vet, right? right? And they're doing this for like 400 species or whatever they have in their zoo. Uh, but you think that the two easiest to find would be it's easy to see a tumor in the brain because something that sticks out, mm -hmm. and then also it's really easy to see tumors in bone. I thought it was really interesting that they weren't finding those because those are like probably the easiest to find just thinking like methodologically. I wonder, well, one thing about the pathologist, the through 
it's not always the same company, but through the accreditation, most of the time it's not the zoo veterinarian doing the pathology. It goes to a pathology company. Um, so, but also interesting, I mean, something I think, I, I don't know, I'm sure you could find out, but one thing I've thought about, because you do see a couple brain cancers, right? Uh, I don't know about in primates, but just in our larger data set, you see some. Um, but I wonder um, with some species, and I'm, I wonder if they are opening up the brain cavity. I, I there's especially in primates uh, and other species of and like uh, big cats. There's a lot of like prion risk and stuff. I wonder if they do. I don't know if they do. I've thought about that though because it is. I mean, exceedingly rare um, in our data set. Um, and I don't think there's any in the primates. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> This is more of just adding to this. I think Midwestern University does the animal pathology for like the Phoenix Zoo and stuff. Mm -hmm. Contacting somebody there. Might yeah, I I didn't realize that, that they did that. I did have a member at AC West who's part of the School of Life Sciences who was at the zoo for a while. Oh, really? That's cool. There's a new faculty member who was working at the zoo. <laughs> now at AC West for those of you on Zoom and those of you in the back who didn't hear. Any questions? Who is that? I forget his name, but he showed me around the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and then I asked where I could get my hand on some animal brains when they were in the And then the conversation went downhill. <laughs> yeah. Question I ask people. Yeah, I was just curious about the cancers or neoplasia that you get at such low age in your data sets. Like, I think it's one of your first slides. Yeah, here. What are all those like zero one year old? Um, well, this is uh, these are not just like this is all of the <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, it's, it's absolute scale, no way, AJ diagnosis, okay, yeah, okay, I thought it was proportional. Uh, but that's like a general question do you like do you see a lot of like those neoplasia or cancers are like incredibly young, basically, in those primates? Uh, well, it, it's not, we don't not see it. We do see it occasionally. But another thing here is like, this is all of the different pathologies. Like there's multiple pathologies demonstrated on this graph. We've done it with just cancer, like in the paper, it's just cancer. Uh, this is all pathology. So it could be, it's like all of the diagnoses made. Um, so that all of them, we just want to show that really, there's not a lot of things that the extension of lifespan drives the specific, any pathologies. Yeah, me. Um, both benign and malignant neoplasms, or do you mean other non neoplasm diseases? Benign and malignant neoplasm, sorry. So there's really low rates of um, uh, blood based cancers, right? Mm -hmm. in, the, in the non human primates. Do we know, right, the hematopoietic? So do we know anything about? Um, uh, Clonomatopoiesis in across the primate tree in terms of like how prevalent it is across different species. Yeah. Um, no, we don't. And I'm you know, now that the talk's over, I'm suspicious about the blood cancers because a lot of them, there a lot of them are described as like lymphoma forward slash leukemia, um, but it's not. It's found because they found some kind of uh, cells or growth in the lymph nodes uh, when they've kind of drained out. Um, so these aren't, st I mean, I, I am confident that they're, they're truly blood cancers in some form, uh, even if we include lymphoma, uh, but beyond that, the cleanness of it, I'm not, I'm not sure. Right. Because they're just really looking at the lymph nodes and what's been dumped in there. That's the only way most, I haven't seen any other diagnoses in that data set that are of blood cancers done in a different way. It's not that they're agreement. Even in it's humans, about 10% are blood cancer. 10% of cancers are blood cancer. Right. So about the same scale. Questions? Sweet. Thank you, Zach. Thank you very much. Thank you.